Good morning. My name is Fred Tang. I'm president of the American China Public Affairs Institute. I know it's a little bit confusing of the faces on the on the board and, and the faces on, on the panel do not exactly match. Uh, Mr. Mr. Liu Yawei actually was going to moderate the panel, but you know he would prefer to sit in the audience and managing some other things, so he asked me to uh, help moderate this panel uh, instead. Um, and first, let me introduce uh, our panelists, and then I would like to add a, a, a few comments as well. Uh, we have, um, well, let me just go this way. Uh, we have Mr. Zhao Su-sheng, uh, editor and uh, Zhao su -sheng. Pardon my hard opinion. <laughs> and then uh, he's the editor uh, of Journal of Contemporary China and professor of University of Denver. And then we have uh, Ms. Carla Freeman, executive director of the SAIS Foreign Policy Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, after that is Michael Swain, uh, senior fellow at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We have also added in the speaker, Mr. Si Ying Hong, Director, Center for American Studies, Renmin University of China. Uh, in the last two days, we had a wonderful, very, very in-depth, very informing two days of uh, events. And thanks to the Cardiff Center, and especially Mr. Liu Yawei uh, and Bob Cat. Uh, they have organized and certainly a lot of volunteers. Um, before we begin, I would like to add a few comments. Uh, while we have a very in-depth uh, discussion, I feel that we also need to add Chinese Americans as a topic of discussion in the future. Because Chinese Americans will play a critical role. In fact, that might be the missing ingredient between the United States and China's negotiations. I feel that on the negotiations, Chinese Americans need to be represented at the most senior level during the delegations. And don't tell me there's not enough Chinese American in the high-ranking position to be filled in. I can name you a dozen names that they all can be very qualified. Um, as a Chinese American, and I, I agree with uh, Professor Gordon Chen of Princeton University, Recently, the Hoover Institution produced a report written by 32 scholars, not politicians. But the report basically have a double standard. If a Chinese American go to the Chinese consulate, we will be accused using by the Chinese government. If a Chinese student go into the consulate, again, it's the same. However, if my colleagues were not Chinese, when they go to a Chinese consulate, that's an exchange. Or American students going to a Chinese consulate or embassy for a reception. Oh, that's great, that's an exchange. So it's a really double standard. And I think I found the report patronizing and condescending at best, and I think racist in reality. So to my friends, to my colleagues who are not Chinese American, I ask you to speak up and speak out against such actions. Because right now, in this country, if we don't speak up, and I can quote, first they come to get Jews, I did not speak up because I'm not a Jew. Then they come to get a trade unionist, I did not speak up because I was not a trade unionist. Then they come to get a communist, I did not speak up because I'm not a communist. Then, when they come to get me, there's no one, nobody else left to speak out for me. Because if we let this environment go on, as Americans, we'll be losing our country. So, for the students, I do have one criticism. Where is the rest of the Emory University? You need to invite your American student friends to come as well. And I see some of them, but not enough. Each of you, when you attend a China summit, a global China summit, 
It's not just for the Chinese students. It is for all of the students. You need to reach out to your American student friends and your international student friends. Bring them to these events so that you can have a discussion. You don't have to agree with each other, but we need to be in the same forum together. On the other hand, it is your right to whether go to the Chinese consulate for a reception, or you can speak out from your perspective of the U.S.-China relation or China's perspective. It is the right in the United States to exercise such. So again, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, at this time speak. Um, maybe I'll just go in this direction, if that's OK. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Zhao. I thought I was the last person on the program. So. Yeah. OK. Michael, Michael, why don't you speak first? Why don't you speak first, and then Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. will speak last. Thank you, Fred. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here at Emory. Um, I am responding to the uh, topic in blurb, which asks whether the shift to hostility and zero-sum thinking toward China of the Trump administration will fundamentally alter the long-term trajectory of this relationship. Before I comment on this, I have to say that this question to me is incredibly one-sided. Um, there are two entities involved in this relationship. We are focusing a lot on the Trump administration, and I'll say something about this in a minute, but we have to recognize, and I'll say something about that as well, that the, China is contributing to this negative dynamic in some very significant ways. And we need to recognize that. Um, I don't know how many people could recognize that in China at a forum like this, but we can talk about it here in the United States. We couldn't talk about it in China. That's a big difference. So I think we need to be more honest about how both sides are contributing to this. But let me speak first about the Trump administration and U.S. shift, because it goes beyond the Trump administration. The shifts we see in Trump policies toward China are in many ways, in my view, extreme and exaggerated versions of what is nonetheless a fundamental bipartisan shift in American elite views toward China from what used to be a pragmatic, cautiously optimistic belief in cooperative engagement hedging, as it was called, to a more ideologically charged, deeply suspicious, and largely pessimistic belief that China has, by and large, been cheating and bullying its way to dominance in Asia and beyond, while America has been largely asleep at the switch. This view is shared to varying degrees by US politicians of all stripes, many academics and think tank analysts, probably a considerable portion of American business people and the larger policy community in Washington where I reside. As far as I can tell, it is not yet fully accepted by the American public at large, which in my view explains, at least in part, why individuals like Vice President Mike Pence make speeches designed to scare the hell out of it. Many factors have produced this situation. Within the U.S., they include the emergence since at least the 2008 financial crisis of a deep level of anxiety about the continued strength of the American system and its dominant place in the world, the rise of a kind of hyper-nationalism that blames America's ills on foreign immigrants and foreign nations, and the general fear that an increasingly strong autocratic China must, by its nature, seek to undermine and weaken America and the West. In some ways, this sentiment reflects and taps into a long-standing, deep, kind of what some people have described as a sort of paranoid style in American politics. To some extent, it's impervious to logic and facts. At the same time, the underlying shift that we are witnessing in the United States should not be taken as an endorsement of the many crazily excessive beliefs and goals of the more extreme anti-China zealots within the Trump White House or elsewhere in parts of the US government. Many knowledgeable observers in Washington and elsewhere deplore the trade war and Trump's obsession with trade deficits. They oppose the ridiculous goal of decoupling the Chinese economy from the US 
and other Western economies. They disagree with the idea that China desires to overthrow the entire global order and replace it with an ill-defined revisionist world order. They reject the simplistic notion that China is pursuing the so-called death trap diplomacy around the world. And many of them see the clear McCarthy-like dangers of the effort to root out all vestiges of Chinese influence in the US, both real and imagined. They see many problems with China's behavior, but they don't buy the totalistic zero-sum arguments of the Trumpists. This suggests that a more pragmatic, sane, problem-solving approach that enhances America's competitive powers while both leveraging and cooperating with China more effectively where needed is possible, albeit almost certainly under a different American leadership. But beyond the US, we must also recognize, as I said at the beginning, that China has in many ways facilitated and reinforced this shift in US views, the more underlying shift. Some believe that the Chinese leadership made a fundamental shift in its strategy towards the United States in 2008, after the financial crisis, toward one dedicated to taking advantage of a supposedly weakening US to undermine its position in Asia and the world and eventually push it out of the Asia Pacific. Indeed, some American scholars, some serious American scholars, claim to confirm such a fundamental shift based on a close read of internal Chinese and public Chinese documents. I don't share this viewpoint. But I do believe that Beijing has become more assertive in many ways, and not always in a good sense. Assertiveness on its own is not to be deplored. People have been long telling and asking China to be more active internationally, and it is. But some of that assertiveness is certainly very troubling. It's more willing to use economic and other forms of coercion against other states. It's more repressive and controlling towards Chinese and ethnic minorities at home and abroad. It's more restive toward foreign company, restrictive toward foreign companies in China. And it's more aggressive in various forms of espionage, especially in the cyber realm, including directed against American and other foreign companies. It has greatly enhanced party and ideological intrusiveness, all the while denying any change in its supposed pursuit of win-win outcomes for all. These actions have given, have given extremists in the US the opportunity they need to advocate their Cold War-like approach and their sledgehammer-like tactics toward dealing with China. The resulting ugly dynamic of growing suspicion and worst case assumptions is increasing the likelihood of future Sino-American political military crises, particularly in Asia. Crises that could indeed propel us into something much worse than we see today, something more similar to a Cold War-like environment. Why do I say this? Because the deepening suspicion and hostility in the relationship is occurring during and in part as a result of a shifting balance of power in Asia, and a general failure to resolve several contentious issues in the region, from Korea to Taiwan, maritime disputes, and disputes over US and other military activities in the region. I think that this shift in power in Asia, which is resulting in a relative decline in what had been American predominance in the maritime realm, is creating an unstable type of rough balance in Asia. We are not there yet, but that's where we're going. This unstable balance could increase the likelihood that China miscalculates through a sense of greater strength and influence to exert its interests in the region in ways that trouble others, and could cause the United States to overreact to that kind of behavior out of a desire to push back against the notion that American relative influence is declining. And so you could have crises that are not intended by either side, but which occur and escalate. Without adequate communication, 
and a clear sense of red lines, and without reassuring understandings on limits and intentions, such miscalculations could indeed prove very difficult to deal with and could lead to, um, could lead to a much worsening relationship, if not to conflict, although I don't predict that we will have conflict. Under current conditions, I'm particularly concerned, as I said yesterday in my comments about the Taiwan issue. There is a potential for Taiwan now to become seen as a strategic football or a strategic asset for the United States to be denied China. If this kind of thought, this kind of outlook, gains more currency in the United States, it would lead, in fact, to the collapse of the One China policy, which was the original basis for normalized relations with China 40 years ago. The result could indeed, in those cases, be a conflict. I'm certainly, as I say, not predicting this, but I'm less confident that the trends are moving in positive directions today than I was a few years ago. So what do we do about this situation? And I'll end with this. Under current leadership in the United States, and I dare say also in China, I don't see a major ability to move away from this trend. That's not to say it's necessarily going to become increasingly more um, adversarial, although it certainly has indications of moving that way. But I think indif influential individuals on all sides, and not just experts on U.S.-China relations, need to speak out more forcefully to call for an end to reckless rhetoric, soothing propaganda utterances about win-win outcomes and mild halfway measures in dealing with the serious sources of discontent and suspicion. I think China needs to focus like a laser on dealing with the sources of Western, and not just American, Western, Japanese, and other discontent about economic policies in China and about the treatment of foreign companies in China, along with questions of cyber espionage, which continue to this day. I think we need to have a serious move towards developing more effective crisis avoidance and crisis management mechanisms between the U.S. and China. What we have today are very narrowly defined, militarily limited, sort of incidents at sea type of crisis management mechanisms. We need something much more ambitious than that, that involves civilian and not just military perceptions and military uh, civilian uh, leaders as well. I think we have to very much do an internal assessment about where Asia is going through a serious strategic dialogue that assesses changes in resources and capabilities among the major powers in the region. This kind of a strategic dialogue was actually initiated during the later months of the Obama administration with China on a private level. Uh, it didn't lead to much because it was very late in that administration, and of course it was thrown aside by the Trump administration. I think we need to try to move towards re-initiating re that kind of a, a dialogue between the United States and China. There's no easy solution to the problems that we face today. I don't think it's inevitable that we're going to be into a, a conflict, and a, as I've said several times, but it certainly is a more dangerous situation today than we have ever faced in the U.S.-China relationship since the establishment of diplomatic normalization. And it really is incumbent on people on all sides to really step back, look at the facts more clearly, and argue for a more pragmatic approach to dealing with the problems between these two countries. And I'll stop there. Thank you. distinguished panel and to have a chance to share a few reflections uh, today on the current state of U.S.-China relations. Uh, we, as, as uh, Dr. Swain mentioned, there are a number of questions we were asked, and the one that I decided to focus on uh, for this panel uh, is um, whether or not the U.S. and China are fated to clash. It seems like a 
echoing, my voice is echoing, sorry about that. Um, I, I found that in putting these remarks together that what I came up with was less analytical and more of a plea uh, because I think we really, I share uh, Dr. Swain's view that we're at, at, a, at a very dangerous moment in our relationship and we need to uh, take action. So I focus more on the immediate term. Uh, there is just no question that the U.S.-China relationship is under severe stress and that there is no obvious off-ramp uh, to improve the relationship, which really makes this, uh, these strains in our relationship particularly dangerous. And there are many reasons for these strains involving multiple dimensions on both sides, as Dr. Swain mentioned, and also unilaterally, and I'll just mention a few of them, long-standing strains over trade and investment, uh, long-side economic nationalism, domestic politics and policies on both sides, uh, intensifying strategic rivalry in Asia, especially in the Western Pacific, where the U.S. now finds itself sharing, operating in a maritime space, uh, at the same mar maritime space as a very powerful Chinese Navy. China's growing and strategically managed global presence through the BRI, uh, it's deepening strategic partnership with Russia, growing concerns in China about the U.S. commitment to the One China policy. Uh, all of these, uh, all of these things, among others, agitate uh, the two countries' mutual misunderstandings and mistrust that have never gone away, uh, born of uh, most recently our Cold War history. In the absence of a common uh, international. Uh, enemy and the global threats of, of climate change and uh, nuclear proliferation have not seemed to be enough, we have slid into a burgeoning mutual security dilemma uh, in our current bilateral relations. Tensions over Taiwan have been a long-standing potential flashpoint in the U.S.-China relationship, but for the first time uh, in, uh, in the last few decades, uh, there's a risk that there, a clash between the two sides outside the Taiwan Strait could quickly escalate from a, a shooting a war into a significant, if not global, conflagration. And I hardly need to say that this would be unspeakably tragic. This alone should act as a restraint on rational actors. But of course, reason has never, uh, has not always acted to constrain our leaders what political scientists like to lump together under the label agency factors may cause leaders to fight for incentives that may not represent the interests of their populations. In addition to the danger of war, there's also the danger that relations between the two sides are just so strained that we try to balance against each other in a way that could replicate many of the features of the Cold War with all of the destructive impacts that that had for our two societies. Uh, their economies and the world economy, but also on the po po political and economic development of smaller states around the world. More immediately, if the trade war escalates and is sustained, given the important role that the U.S. and Chinese economies play through trade and investment with each other, as well as through the rest of the world, uh, to generating new global growth. There's no question that it's going to hit both of our domestic economies hard, but it's going to have a hefty uh, global impact. It's hard to see this here in thriving Atlanta, but the OECD projects global trade is, could decline by 2%, and global growth could be 0.8% lower in 2021, with our two economies hit even harder. Uh, the drop in global growth atop the collapse of many commodities prices in recent years is already hitting the poorest regions of the world hardest, stoking social unrest. In China, it could lock the country into a middle income track, trap with uncertain social and political consequences for China given, and given China's importance as an international actor for the world. But. <laughs> Improving the U.S.-China relationship and shifting its current trajectory is not impossible. I, we've heard a lot over about the Thucydides trap, uh, but remember that's not a prediction, that's a cautionary tale, and there is nothing ineluctable about the current deterioration in the U.S.-China relationship. We can navigate a, a way forward to begin to de-escalate our mutual anxieties 
toward restoring at least constructive interaction in the interest of our two economies, our societies, and the world. Why do I think this is possible? First of all, because we have to do it. It's, we're, in a, we're at a point where the situation is so risky, uh, it, is, uh, it is risking world peace. But beyond that, I think if we set our expectations about what actually constitutes improvement in the bilateral relationship realistically at a level that we can achieve, and here my idea is that baby steps, baby steps are still steps forward. We can uh, move ahead. So in my view, we shouldn't try to aim for a grand reset in the relationship. We shouldn't measure improvement by whether or not we're making headway to the, toward a new type of great power relationship that uh, Xi Jinping proposed in Sunny Lands in 2014. That was, of course, problematic for the United States because it included, among other things, a proposition of mutual acceptance of each other's core interests and concerns, not all of which, of course, the US can accept nor can it be the kind of comprehensive U.S.-China relationship for the 21st century that Hu Jintao and Obama had, had proposed, because that proved, proved very brittle, because it rested heavily on, on climate change and a few other uh, areas of, of common uh, interest. Rather, we should try to make progress on a limited set of issues, to try to rebuild stability in our bi bilateral interactions in the immediate term. And the goal would be to send in a message to the US and Chinese publics, including our policy communities, that cooperation is okay, it's politically correct, it's positive, and to reintroduce channels for dialogue and mutual problem solving, diplomacy in other words, as well as the concept of mutual gains back into the relationship with the, the goal of establishing channels to try to mit mitigate misunderstanding and to prevent the escalation of problems into crisis situations. We can start by using the opportunities presented by current, uh, the current negotiations over the challenges that we are, are, are working on right now, including uh, trade, to start, to, uh, to start this process. Uh, it's not clear that negotiations between the two sides are gonna yield mutually satisfactory outcomes, but there is some progress, there's signs of this, and it is, even possible that we could wind up with a more constructive relationship, economic relationship, by actually having addressed festering American concerns about market access to China and the deficit, uh, trade deficit, and Chinese invest concerns about the uh, protections of its own investments in the United States, et cetera. And there are many other areas making progress toward uh, Peace and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula is, uh, is one opportunity. Working together on stabilization and development in Afghanistan, where the two countries are already engaged in a number of cooperative projects, including dipl training diplomats, health, uh, uh, training uh, health workers, and agricultural workers. Counter-narcotics is another area for uh, uh, cooperation in Asia. And we could even think about cooperating on infrastructure development. Presidential level intervention would certainly help give all of these acts of cooperation a boost. And on the American side, I want to remind the audience that this is not impossible uh, under President Trump. Despite the language uh, of, of Vice President Pence's speech and the language in the US national defense and security strategies, about China as a major threat, a language that I, I think I see echoed in Chinese discourse on strategic affairs. The president said last spring in a foreign policy speech, quote, we desire to live peacefully and in friendship with Russia and China. We have serious difficulties with these two nations and must regard them with open eyes, but we are not bound to be adversaries. We should seek common ground based on our shared interests. Let me end by saying that international politics uh, or policies made mainly on the basis of natural, national interests feels very unnatural for many, if not most, Americans because it appears far too transactional and devoid of values. And this is particularly the case when repressive political control appears on the rise uh, in China, not least for China's uh, minority Muslim population. In addition, cooperation of any kind can be seen as enabling of China's strategic ambitions by providing, uh, by improving conditions for our rival. 
politically, cooperation, even around issues with very limited objectives, can be seen as an endorsement of China's policies that are anathema to American ideals. But the reality is that we desperately need to ease tensions to prevent escalation now. On the American side, it doesn't mean that we abandon deterrence, we abandon support for our allies, or we end our important role in taking issue with policies that damage progress toward human rights. But in the current climate, we need a mutual effort to pursue even limited opportunities for cooperation wherever they arrive, even if this is small steps toward more of a detente than toward a broad reset in the relationship. Stop there. Uh, my, my name is Sam Zhao. I came from China 30 years ago. And I share some, uh, Mr. Deng mentioned that uh, concerns uh, uh, the situation and the relationship between China and US now is in a very, very difficult situation. People from China, all Chinese Americans are under some kind of pressures I never felt. In fact, uh, I've been in this country 34 years, have seen two crises, uh, which I mean, Compatible. One was uh, 1989 when it occurred uh, crisis. When I think back of this crisis, I see some similarities. At that time, the U.S. pulled uh, sanctions against China, and uh, and, and the Bush administration then administration tried to link China's uh, uh, most favored nations to the human rights. You see a lot of the American side and China's uh, responses. Uh, uh, but uh, I do see some uh, differences there too. Uh, during 1989, uh, which also followed by the end of Cold War, China was somehow uh, isolated and uh, uh, for sure. But I don't see the overwhelming negative attitudes uh, in American, uh, 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 among a lot of American policymakers and uh, 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 scholars uh, and the business uh, community, uh, and also at the very top of the leaderships, both sides uh, tried to um, mediate, tried to um, uh, uh, reduce those tensions uh, as quick as possible. Especially, I saw there was a very strong um, pro-engagement coalition at that time uh, from business community, from China scholars. Uh, from the uh, foreign policy statements, and uh, they argue that uh, uh, the the end, cold, end of Cold War is a good sign that China will change, and uh, the communist dictatorship, communist regime will not last. So we still have hope. If we are patient enough, China will change, will change eventually. So we will work, work with the Chinese people and. Uh, uh, try to facilitate that type of uh, uh, changes. On the China side, I do see at that time a very pragmatic attitude. China tried to uh, follow Deng Xiaoping's Tao Wang Yanghui to avoid uh, confrontation uh, with the United States, uh, try to uh, focus on domestic uh, reform and domestic economic development. And uh, so, in that case, uh, the crisis uh, quickly uh, uh, went away. In fact, uh, by the second term of the Clinton administration, uh, Jiang Zemin visited the United States so, and tried to build up a strategic partnership toward the 21st uh, century. And Clinton also changed his uh, uh, attitude, uh, supported China uh, uh, entry into WTO. In fact, I remember 2000, at that time, uh, uh, Clinton, President Clinton had a speech at uh, uh, SAIS, in fact, uh, Colorado University, and basically uh, said that China entry into WTO uh, does not, it means China uh, not only is going to buy our products, what they are going to buy are the most fundamental principles of the democracy, for economic freedom. So China entered WTO, and uh, uh, in that uh, context, uh, the 1989 or the end of Cold War, China isolation and China's uh, the crisis between China and US was somehow uh, went uh, over. 
But this time, I think it's very different. And I don't know how long this crisis will last, because uh, the uh, sentiments on both sides are very different at this time. In fact, uh, uh, what the, 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 the panel talk about geopolitical, geostrategic uh, competition, and the competition has somehow, I think, defined co uh, cooperation. Earlier speaker, I mean, uh, Professor, uh, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, there's no options. We have to cooperate. The, uh, the competition is a vicious competition is not an option. But now I think from not people in both sides, this is the only option now is not only competition, but vicious. Competition. That's why we see those kind of talking about the so-called uh, uh, cold wall. Talking about those kind of cold wall uh, 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 metaphor, uh, I remember still seven or eight, ten years ago. I'm a, a political scientist uh, 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 studying IR. Uh, and the argument by John M. Sharma at uh, Chicago University talking about uh, uh, structural realist uh, uh, inevitability of uh, rising power and uh, incumbent power. And the U.S. has to make responses by containing China in all fronts was uh, dismissed by most scholars as uh, simplistic, the structuralist inevitability. You don't look at domestic issues, look at many other variables, you look at only the structure issue is so simplistic. Now this argument has been accepted very, very widely by a scholarly community. The uh, human studies uh, uh, track is identical like this. And the power transition uh, theory has also been applied to the US-China competition. Basically here is uh, the argument is that uh, uh, this power transition uh, got to be violent because uh, China and the US, not like the US and the UK, has a totally different culture, totally different value system, totally different history. So they cannot work together uh, finding a peaceful transition. And Cold War II, our new Cold War theory now has also be, become very popular. They argue that Cold War II is different from Cold War I, because Cold War I, the Soviet Union was only a military power, economically, and the Soviet Union was not, uh, did not matter. And China now has a much, much more, uh, more, much more powerful economic uh, strength. So China could compete with the US on all fronts, not only militarily, but economically, diplomatically, politically. Uh, China would uh, use its power its uh, value system, its hierarchical authoritarian uh, culture to overtake the United States. So the strategic competition, these type of theories have uh, become so popular. So this is a very different, dif uh, very different uh, situation. And also uh, Americans think in China has taken advantage of the US free society, free economy, and China rights is not uh, legitimate. Many of this kind of sentiment has been very, very strong in the uh, U.S. side. Also in the China side, you can also see those kind of uh, many, many concerns of the rational scholars like uh, Wang Yisi, all those kind of scholars concerned about uh, the conflicts um, from both sides are um, pull, uh, when this kind of mentality are pushing these countries into a collision cause. So how we got here, who should we blame the uh, Michael uh, a swing mentioned both sides. I think that's, that's right. In fact, uh, uh, I went to China a lot, talking to Chinese uh, scholars. I try to, try to present some balanced views. Very often you can find they blame America uh, so much. America uh, does not want to see China rise in the U.S., tries to prevent China to uh, rise to be a peer power. The U.S. never wants to see China really to become the Chinese way of a life. A lot of blames. Yes, U.S. has a lot of problems, we mentioned that. To the China side has also its own um, plans to, uh, uh, to bear. In fact, uh, uh, yesterday, Susan, I think yesterday, Susan uh, Thornton mentioned that America's, uh, Americans have a lot of reflections, for sure. But China side has lack of those uh, uh, reflections, for sure. 
In fact, uh, I see China change uh, uh, attitudes toward the U.S. start the financial crisis 2008-2009. That was a turning point for China's attitudes uh, change toward China. Before that, China was still following Tao Wan Yanghui, trying to uh, adapt to the, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, unipolar uh, world, uh, U.S. Uh, as a most powerful nation. But uh, since 2008-2009, the U.S. in the eyes of many Chinese is no longer the U.S. we saw years ago. I still remember 2009 uh, when the financial start, the crisis started. Lin Jiabao at the National People's Congress uh, 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 press conference said, uh, U.S. Uh, and the mismanagement of their economy uh, should be blamed. You should make sure we our uh, we bought American security, American uh, debt is safe. Basically, he even in Beijing, I thought, should we save America to buy American securities? They thought they thought Americans are should be grateful. Now China is uh, doing well. China is helping America, so America should be um, paying back. They thought U.S. arms sale to Taiwan. And uh, U.S. Uh, 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 relationships with uh, uh, Japan and many other countries as something U.S. tried to um, uh, contain in China. In fact, Obama was treated really bad by the Chinese uh, uh, leadership during the, uh, 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 his two terms, especially the first term. The, his visit, his state visit to, to Beijing yeah, was totally, totally a mismanagement. Yeah, by, by the China side. It, 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 I really watched that with the, some, somehow. I was in Shanghai. Uh, President Bush uh, gave a speech, public speech in Tsinghua University, live broadcast. And uh, uh, President Clinton gave a, uh, a, a, a public lecture at Peking University, live broadcast. Obama had a town hall meeting in Shanghai. No. No TV station in China covered it. Only FedEx from Hong Kong covered it. But I watched 10 seconds delay because they were ready to cut off if he said anything they did not like. So that was a turning point I see China's attitude toward US. Since then, China became increasingly confident that uh, uh, US uh, is in trouble, China is in rising, China is uh, going to be a pure power, if not more powerful than the United States. That attitude since 2009-2010 has been really amazing if you go, went to Beijing at that time. And then you see American business community, everyone began to complain about what's going on in China, the changes, everything uh, in China. Politically, I don't want to say too much in the front of Chinese students, you know better than I know. Uh, what's going on since then uh, in China. Externally, I think Michael Wayne mentioned all those kind of behaviors, certain behaviors for sure. Even in the, I mean, let me just uh, quote a Chinese uh, uh, scholar who founded the film which we, more, we watched last night. He, 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 he mentioned that uh, China entry into uh, WTO, China, he said, this is Eric Lee. He said, China effectively negotiated into the WTO on preferential terms by taking advantage of the Western illusion of the eventuality of a globalized economic order. Yet, China does not and probably never will subscribe to the universal ideology of democratic liberalism and is a vibrant market economy, uh, essentially not capitalism. That's Eric Lee. I was, when I read that part, I feel, wow, he's honest. That's the attitudes of China during that time. So China's side should bear, should reflect what's going on or what's going wrong in the relationship from the China side. Of course, it takes two to tango, for sure. Americans should be also blamed. I came to the U.S. in 1985. That time, the U.S. was very confident U.S. Was, has a very open-minded, but U.S. has changed since then. I would argue that. Maybe Michael can correct, correct me for 
<laughs> uh, on this side. So, since September 11, the U.S. I have lived in is not the U.S. I lived before September 11. Since then, U.S. has become increasingly insecure, increasingly incompetent, and uh, in increasingly not insisting in its liberal values. And uh, uh, September 11 was an opportunity, opportunity for U.S. to try to spread, uh, I mean, to def not only defend its interests, but uh, to occupy moral high ground. But U.S. lost that opportunity, for sure. U.S. took advantage of September 11 to defend a so-called unipolar moment. For that uh, unipolar moment, U.S. overextended, overreached, overplayed its hand. That's what we saw current administration was in office. This gave a lot of complaints, gave a lot of uh, a divided, uh, I mean, produced a divided society in the United States. So a lot of problems in the U.S. has also um, produced what we're going up, we have seen today. In fact, one of them is, one of the very important thing is that U.S. is no longer trying to change China for the better, for the free, uh, liberal and uh, uh, um, prosperous China. U.S. become so scared about China. And in fact, uh, according to Jamia Sharma, this kind of a liberal he hegemony would fail eventually, who fell to liberalism, but uh, nationalism and realism, I'll stop uh, quickly. But a lot of people blame China from that perspective. So US side also should be blamed. But uh, what we are go going from here, what I don't see is the Cold War type of a confrontation. There are some aspects of those kind of confrontations. For example, the science uh, and technology decoupling has happened. Science, science technology um, cold war somehow started, and also uh, the trying to cut even the exchanges between students, all those things. But economic uh, interdependence is still underpinning this relationship. So for the future, the time uh, constraint, I will not uh, say too much. But the for the future, I see I see we are not uh, natural partners, but we are not natural enemies either. So we are both partners and uh, competitors. We're not vicious competition, but a health, healthy competition is very important foundation for the relationship. So I stop here. Thank you. Uh, this panel, we're focusing on US-China political and security issue. Our last speaker is the Mr. Si Ying Hong, Director, Center for American Studies at the Renmin University. Mr. Si. I believe it is needed from the perspective of strategic and political affairs to compare an Anglo-German library in 1907 with China-U.S. library in 2018. And I believe that the, in this way, we can reveal and, uh, the severity of the China-U.S. library today. And we can reveal and, uh, the separate confrontation or even conflict of potentialities in this library. After that, I would like to do a sort of efforts in reverse direction and for balance. And to serious doubt or question, so-called alarmist opinion, and which many, many in this world held about a cycle. Sino American library. First, and what, what about 1907? Because at that year, Anglo Russian intent was reaching. And so, two military, two camps 
across Europe began to establish, which of course, and the seven years later, they launched World War at that time, Great War. At that historical moment, although there's already Anglo-French England, as well as Anglo-Russian uh, England, although they're already the very well-known claw memorandum, and uh, which written by a strategist, in Cyprus strategy in 1906, and uh, which began to transform the grand strategy orientation of Great Britain at the time. But at the same time, Anglo-German rivalry, in terms of uh, severity, and in terms of probability of Great Britain involving the future major conflict, still far from acceptable to British Parliament and British Army. Not only that, if we look at Anglo-German rivalry in 1907, and if we look at, at that time, the probability of future major conflict, and uh, which, the, 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 what, what was the element which really shocked the British national side? Only one, the massive German construction of worship. Only one. And if we look at the German, German's dual strategic provocation or challenge, and we found and uh, this kind of challenge at that time and was only included first in German China to the spare influence of French and Russia and which and, uh, is far from and until 1914 and the British military ally. As well as German the challenge and against part of British overseas parallels to front, South Africa and the Turkey. That means that at that time, German Empire still have not, you know, to challenge the real British strategic forward front, that is North Sea and Low, low countries compared with China and the rest at today. And we compare first that the degree of mobilization within the United States against China was, it is far from severe and comprehensive than and the Great Britain in 1907 because whether U.S. Congress or U.S. public opinion in general, especially represented by the mass media, and has been persuaded that China is number one rivalry in short term, mid term, and even in long term of the United States and prosperity, power, and state in the world political economy. And the three major political forces in today's United States, that is populist Republicans, so-called mainstream Republicans and Democrats, all of them have shaped consensus that China is number one long-term, mid-term, short-term antagonist of the United States. And also, and uh, starting orientation to compete with China and in various major functional areas. The most fundamental orientation policy, I think, has already been have at least essential consensus. Not all, but those areas, essential consensus among these three major political forces. Moreover, you look at real strategic front rivalry between China and the United States today. And uh, this strategic rivalry 
And not only most essential come from China's massive strategic build-up, that the build-up of China's you know, long-distance power project capability. But all we, we which is in some way similar with massive construction of ships in you know, second rate at that time. But also, most important, the strategic portion, massive portion in South China Sea. And in a less degree, maybe, some strategic implication in battle. From American perspective, especially from American perspective of those strategists, this is different from Taiwan problem. If, if China only pursue the reunification of you know, across the strait, I think that, the, of course, maybe the American strategy and politician were not public citizens, but they think that this is still China's maybe legitimate right, legitimate aspiration, and especially if this and uh, conducted without massive military attack against Taiwan. And still, essentially, it is something just like defensive. But South China Sea is different. And uh, China, especially through American strategic perspective, began dramatically to challenge strategic forward front of American and its military allies in the Western Pacific. Finally, ideology. If you look at ideology situation and ideology competition or rivalry between Great Britain and the Second Republic of Germany in 1907, of course we found and uh, such kind of situation. Parliamentary democracy versus, you know, the authoritarian, the, 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 the um, imperial authoritarian system. And we also call the founder between Great Britain and Germany at the time. And the so called on the British side, the pan peaceful political culture versus the German side and the pan, you know, milit militarist political culture. But that, at that time, is a normal situation. Almost for decades. But now, if we look at from ideological perspective of the situation and uh, between Washington and Beijing, most important things which so somewhat exaggerated, somewhat you know, make too much prominent is American perceived China's dramatic events happened in you know last year. And a dramatic comparison. What is the comparison from American's perspective? The China now is not only stop to you know, engage in reform, but to reverse. Reverse what Deng Xiaoping and the empirical front, the economic front, and foreign policy front, what Deng Xiaoping has done. So in American eyes, Sano. China, the Southern American ideological front, especially in this aspect, is very much prominent and very much inducing to antagonism. So, not only that he's stupid, so brand the, 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 the optimist, but even I do not, I never use for my my position never use even prudent optimism. Prudent optimism is probably not reliable. And, uh, but also, in situation is serious as such, but I still serious question, so-called alarmist opinion. Why? Because five points. First, if we look at about four decades before the outbreak of the First World War, you look at the international power distribution and especially the great dynamics of this power transition. And you found that the, that was much more strong, much more drastic than the situation today. Why? 
Because only in 10 years of 1860s, three great powers drastic rise. Germany and the United States after the end of the Civil War, and Japan after the Ninja Restoration, which launched in 1867. At that time, this world cannot absorb such drastic change. And so this is maybe the number one fundamental reason of our wake of first, first war. But if you look at today, only China, a single power, of course, this is this is massive continental city China, just to rise. And, and between China and the United States, the comprehensive balance of transnational strength, still China, you know, lay behind in a substantial degree and from today's United States, even maybe right with the current United States. And this gap is much, much more wider than and uh, balance of strength between Great Britain and Germany and Zapire. So, and from this, this world, compared with the world as a time, still and have remarkably less strong dynamics for conflict. And this world today still have a remarkably simple structure. And this world therefore still easier compared with that time to be managed. Second point, and international war, international ethics, and international political system. And today, although and very much worse than the, 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 most of the time since the end of Cold War, but still much less statistic, much less social Darwinist, much less like the you know, political culture of jungle war. And uh, so, reading this, the major conflict between world powers uh, still have uh, much less probability than and, uh, 100 years ago. Almost. Never should. Is there, is there, is there, uh, okay, sir, so, sir. So, okay. <laughs> okay, please finish. What, uh, yeah. Of course, please. International mechanism, institutional arrangement, mechanism, you compare with the situation before the army of the Civil War. This is far from, in Kissing the words, and doomsday doom military machine, doomsday diplomacy. machine. And so I think that all the situation now is very much worse for any realistic and a clear minded. The, the, the scholars and experts and other people are still not so Of course, what is so-called middle power and a small power which and the two so-called third parties to make the conflict happen, conflict happen, confrontation, this element. I think, of course, East Asia, Western Pacific, there's Japan, there's China, there, North Korea, South Korea, and so on. But, Compare with the Anglo, the, the, the Austrian Hungary Empire, compare with Ottoman Empire, and uh, within their imperial front, frontiers, and I think that the, 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 the structure and the conflict for uh, the, the dynamics of conflict is still today is much more, you know, milder than as a final. China. Contemporary China has such a mainstream of political culture, strategic culture, or mainstream historians. If you compare this with and political culture, strategic culture in second record after 19, 1890, when Bismarck and forced to be stepped down, I think that also you know, that in most in recent years, in past six years, have a lot of change happening in China political strategy. But still, we have done something man. We still relatively prudent. We still put domestic affairs at the priority. We still and take attention to if, if there is a, a risk and, uh, and, uh, and, and a pleasure, we often try to avoid it. And we do not afraid to make even major concessions. So, 
Conclusion. The future is really uncertain. And what compare with the previous four decades, the world political affairs and strategies are definitely much more dangerous than at that time. And human memories, human society moved by memory, but memory is always short. We call it. American people, Chinese people could so easily forget a lot of things. And so, also, and both China and United States still have a great distance to suit that trap. But compared with the past four decades, we move much nearer to that damned trap. And so, we should take a strong sense of worldliness. We shall take a prudent pessimism. It could help us to be more prudent, and then we have greater, greater hope to make the worst scenario. And we're not, you know, further developed, or even finally we can avoid it. Thank you very much. We, we have five minutes left. Uh, Michael, Carla, Suisa, if you want to add. Anything? One or two minutes? Do you have any comments or want to? I see Carlos taking a lot of notes. If if not, yeah. we'll have one one question. understand it, he, he was asking, when you look back at China's history over the last uh, 30 years or so, it really hasn't been very aggressive in any sort of military sense. It hasn't used force. Um, and yet this Thucydides trap that Graham Allison refers to and others repeat ad nauseum, um, basically assumes that China's kind of a, a, bad, a rising power, pardon me, a rising power is a, is a bad power. Um, yeah, not very good power. And I'm a, I'm a something just like history. History is so complicated. At a modern year, structural factor are weak. We are very weak. But the situation is special. Personality factor is very strong. Now we have two factors, and which or three all three factors, which to remind the Chinese and Americans and all of the world that. The, 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 the real confrontation was more possible there at that time. Structurally, China become much more strong. And the situational factor, and uh, because and we have this kind of water situation, and also, and because, and if the nation become much more stronger, national intention could in some way transfer. Finally, we have our shipping commander, Xi Jinping, until now, until now, and he's so well known for assertive, strategic behavior. So let me very briefly, I divide Chinese foreign policy into three periods. The first period is so-called revolutionary diplomacy, which wants to export its model and ideology in the meantime insecure, very weak. Second period was a development uh, diplomacy, the Yao Ping period, try to use the national environment um, for China's economic modernization. The third period is the current period. Xi Jinping is a big power diplomacy. China becomes much more confident. 
and uh, try to use its power to uh, 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 become strong. That's the, as I said, more Mac Chan stand up, the Yuppie Mac Chan and rich, he is Mac and Chan and powerful. Okay, just very briefly, I mean, I think the, part of the answer to your question is, I don't think Allison and those who talk about this Thucydides trap are talking necessarily about intentions, evil, good, they're talking, as, as you know, just said, they're, they're talking about the impact of two things in the international system. And they're, and they're basically structural problems. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a question of a change in relative power that makes a, a dominant power less confident that it will be able to defend its interests. Because this rising power, which also in some, in some sense is a non-status quo power by definition, will alter the underlying assumptions about the international order because it rises, right? And, and, then, and, then, and then you have this notion that the objectives there, that, that, that all powers, great powers, seek to maximize their power in order to defend their interests. And that power maximization in an anarchic global environment creates enormous uncertainty. And so people opt in the direction of uh, strengthening their position. So you get into a security dilemma. And the security dilemma is a function of that uncertainty in a power maximizing environment. That's sort of the way political scientists explain the Thucydides trap. But, but, but I think the, my question is, okay, the total difference between the behavior of Chinese or the use of force, the pattern of that, when China was much weaker, was far frequently or conflict prone than a rising strong power. So Thetis thesis actually, uh, you know, really based on the prominent premise that a rising of any power, but a strong and, and much, much stronger China has not fought any major way. We, we can argue this endlessly, but I would- How do you explain with, the, the gap? I would agree with Ian Hong. When you look at the Korean War, the Korean War had two different factors involved. One was Mao Zedong and his view of international relations at the time and his power in the Chinese system. The second one was there was a clear threat to China's territorial integrity that came from that conflict. We can talk about the origins of it as something, but, but that, was a limited, that was a limited conflict. That was not the kind of global conflagration and global great power competition in the broader sense that I think people are talking about when they talk about the Thucydides trap. Carla, we'll have the last word, Carla. No, I, I just wanted to say that, to mention that the Thucydides trap is about a power transition. I mean, and, and it's, not an, it's not an inevitable thing. Uh, to the point about uh, China's conflict uh, during the previous uh, uh, periods of, in, under Mao Zedong, for example, those were limited conflicts, and they were deliberate. They, for example, uh, in the 1962 Sino-Indian uh, conflict, uh, China withdrew after teaching uh, uh, India a lesson. Similarly, China had limited objectives when it uh, attacked uh, Vietnam in 1979. So those were exactly, as Professor Swain said, not uh, not the kind of great power conflicts that are involved in a in a power transition. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, the organizer also want to apologize to uh, Professor Seeing Hong for mixing up his original in terms of serving on this panel and so forth. Uh, I just want to turn back my time since being a moderator. Thank you very much, and you can continue our conversation. <laughs>